This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Chris McLean, lead pastor here at Shady Grove United Methodist Church. If you are new among us, I hope that you'll sign in. Leave us a little information about yourself. We would love to get to know you better. Also today, I want to celebrate graduate recognition. All you high school and college graduates, we are so proud of all that you've achieved. It is a great blessing in our lives to have watched you grow, watched you through the course of this journey, to have been praying and encouraging you. And that continues to be our call to pray for and encourage and celebrate you as you take this next step in life. God bless you. Friends, we are ready to begin worship. Uh, we're going to begin a little mini series uh, with me, Pastor Chris, on the three simple rules of Methodism. And so I hope you enjoy the first rule, which is first, do no harm. Let's worship. saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thanks so much for joining me today for the children's moment. I'm so glad you're here. I brought something fun to show you this morning. What is this? Right, it's a dog. But what kind of dog is this? 
Look on his head, that might give you a clue. Right, it's a graduation dog. My daughter Jane Claire got this when she graduated from high school. And this morning we are celebrating friends that are graduating from high school and college. What does it mean to graduate? To graduate means when you're going from one thing, you're finishing up one thing, and then you're moving on to something else, right? So let's look at this hat again. How many of you have ever worn a hat that had four corners like this and a tassel in the middle and a button in the middle? I know some of you wore a hat like this when you graduated from preschool. I saw pictures, they were white hats, right? Yeah, so let's look at this hat. How, how many corners does it have? It has four corners, it does. It's in the shape of a square, isn't it? And it has a button in the middle with a tassel on it. Right, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So let's imagine that these four corners actually signify an important thing in your life. And this button right here in the center is God, represents God. So the first corner we might think of might be when you graduate from preschool, where everybody knew your name and everybody knew you and you knew everybody. Maybe you came to the church nursery and to Cal and to Sunday school. And when you graduate from preschool, you go to kindergarten at a big school where you meet lots of new people and you start to have new experiences like maybe Cub Scouts or Brownie Scouts and sports. Sometimes new people and new experiences can seem a bit scary, right? But remember, God is right here in the middle, right here with you, always. Then the next corner might be like when you graduate from elementary and middle school. This is a time when your moms and your dads take you everywhere you go, like Sunday school and cow and vacation Bible school and soccer games and swim meets. And what is right in the middle? God, God is right in the middle of all you do. And moms and dads, I'm sorry to let you know, but this next corner comes quicker than you can imagine. So the next corner comes when you graduate from high school. This, this is the one that many of our graduates are celebrating here with us this morning. You've been living at home and learning at school and growing in your faith. At this point, you've started probably driving yourself to where you need to go and to your activities and to school. Maybe you've been on some mission trips. Maybe you've been a helper or a leader at Cal or Vacation Bible School. And now it's another big step where you might be moving away from your family and going off to college or to a job. This can be exciting and scary, but remember what's right here in the center. Right here in the center is God and God will help you with everything. So there's one more corner, and that last corner is where you are a grown up in life. You may have a career, you may be married, you may have a family, you may be making lots of choices every day. Do you think that might be scary sometimes? And where is God? Right in the center. God is right in the center. God is always right here with us. And when we keep our focus on God and stay connected to God, new things are less scary and more exciting. With God at the center, all things are possible. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for always being with us. When we graduate or move from one thing to another, help us remember that with you at the center of our lives, all things are possible. Amen.
We come now to our scripture and our message. And for the scripture, you get a two for one. We're starting out in Matthew 22, the 34th verse through the 40th. And then we'll go to the first letter that Paul wrote to Thessalonica. And we'll be in the second chapter, verses one through eight. Hear now the word of God. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question in order to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
and then to Paul's letter. He writes to a church he had come to know well, but in a place where he had experienced some tension and perhaps in a place where there might have been gossip or murmuring, these words. He says, you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal about the gospel does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with this good news, the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words or flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made some demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Friends, from these two parts of the Bible, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our message this morning is first, do no harm. And as we begin, I want to ask you, what is the power of a moment? Let's start right there. What's the power of a moment? Can a moment define you? Does a word, an action, or an oversight reveal somebody's character? Does one instant have the power to label a child for life? What is the power and what is the meaning of a moment in life? For those that we keep our distance from or just have some distance from, a moment may be all it takes for us to make a judgment. A moment is often all it takes to decide if a stranger seems safe or helpful or interesting. And consider all of the quick determinations that we make based on one post, one question from somebody, or even one moment of silence. But for those close at hand, a moment might become one of many, many moments. And the power of those moments, therefore, begins to seem somewhat different. With those we know well, a flash of anger may be placed in context. We might say, oh, there's so much pressure right now. Or oversights might be forgiven. If someone is late for a meeting, we might say, well, maybe there's been an accident or something. And so, do moments really have the power to define character? As I considered this question this week, I thought of someone that I knew named Pat. Uh, Pat and I, when we lived in the same town, were preparing to move at the same time. And so I had a chance to attend Pat's going away party, which was so much fun. Pat and her church had had 26 years of powerful moments to bring to closure, and they had a lot to celebrate. They been in Sunday school classes for 26 years together. They'd written plays together and acted them out. They'd been in meeting after meeting together. They'd written curriculums. They'd shared joys and sorrows. And so to celebrate the church members, they prepared meatballs and cake and bruschetta and chocolate eclairs and punch and ham and cheese croissant and fruit and vegetable plates, a spread so much food. But that wasn't all that was in store for Pat because that day they were taking charge and they dressed Pat as a queen and they made her a homemade throne and they placed a ribbon across her that said, Patsy Perfect. Patsy Perfect. 
that probably says all you need to know, but it, it maybe it helps if I tell you that Pat is much more organized than the average bear, and that organization defined a lot of her moments. So once they had Pat right where they wanted on her homemade throne, the members thanked her for the many classes that she had taught, and they challenged her with a game in which the children of the church hid behind a curtain and they pretended to be Bible characters that Pat had taught them about over the years, and Pat had to guess who all of these biblical characters were. The United Methodist women also had a joyful and gentle and fun-spirited roast for Pat, and everyone laughed and celebrated. And so, so many powerful moments were represented in this day at the celebration that defined Pat as someone who has loved God and loved others, been a disciple of Jesus and a prayer warrior. And Pat had this big smile on her face. And yet in Pat's joy, there was this tinge of discomfort you could see. It was hard for Patsy Perfect to receive this kind of praise because Pat knew that she was far from perfect. In fact, Pat was painfully aware of some really powerful moments in her life, regular moments that brought her shame. And these moments would befall Pat whenever she sat in her car and turned the ignition, because in those moments, Patsy Perfect Prayer Warrior became Patsy Poundum Road Warrior. That's right. Pat, who had lovingly instructed the children of the church for 26 years in Sunday school had a rip-roaring case of road rage. She would honk and scream and beat the steering wheel. If someone made a mistake driving or drove too slowly, she'd become unglued. And she knew that these moments of intense anger and impatience were moments that were totally outside of God's call for her Christian character. Although Pat would sometimes laugh about these moments, more often she would ask for prayer support. Pat wanted help out of her road rage because she wanted more of the moments of her life to be defined by Christ-like love. And I think that's something that we can all identify with. We don't want the moments of our lives to be defined by road rage or frustration or impatience indifference, fear, distance, self-pity, or contempt. I think we want to live that greatest commandment to love God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. But like Pat, we have our moments, moments that bring us shame and pain and disappointment. So here's where Patsy Perfect comes in handy. Uh, she reminds us with her perfection of our founder, John Wesley. Uh, I sometimes wonder if he was a little on the eh, obsessive side, maybe a little compulsive, but, but even if he was, um, his own perfectionism uh, ended up being something he could reflect upon and pray about. And he had some insights uh, that are helpful for us. So John Wesley, um, the accidental founder of Methodism, taught that we could expect to be made perfect in this life. And this is an amazing thing for him to say, because if anybody just picked at every little thing that might be wrong in himself, it was John Wesley. But he expected to be made perfect in this life. And by that, he didn't mean perfect in grammar, organization, timing, or that we would be free of mistakes. John Wesley taught that we could hope to be made perfect in love. He taught that through Christ, we are both forgiven of our sins, but not just forgiven, we are also changed from moment to moment by the power of the Holy Spirit until that grip of sin in our lives is broken, and then we are free to more and more show that love through our lives, the love that's the same love of how God loves, and we're able to live according to God's will. He emphasized that in Christ, we actually get to grow into a true new life and become, through transformation, a new creation. 
Now for her part, Pat knew that some of these really intense moments in her life needed perfecting in God's love. And she knew that her road rage, far from being loving, was actually a harm. It was a harm to herself and a harm to others. She knew that dealing with this issue in her life was an important step in her faith journey. And that is a place that I'm certain that John Wesley, if he sat down as pastor and counseled her, would have encouraged her to work with God on. In the beginning days of the Methodist revival, because that's how Methodism started, as a revival movement within the Church of England, all that was required to be part of this spiritual revival movement called Methodism was that you had a desire to flee from the wrath to come. That's how they said it, a desire to flee from the wrath to come and a desire to turn from sin. And then if you wanted to stay a member, you had to follow three rules. They called them general rules. The first rule was and still is do no harm. It's a rule for everyone. It's a rule that we can start teaching as soon as a child is old enough to fling beets across the table, as one of my professors used to say. And this rule, do no harm, it never goes out of style. Do no harm. It's a simple rule. And in its simplicity, it has a way of wiggling itself into the countless moments in our lives, moments when we might struggle with holding on to the example and love of Christ. Where are some of those moments for you? When we do no harm to ourselves, we recognize God's love for us. And when we do no harm to our neighbors, we respect the great worth that God sees in each and every person. And when we seek to do no harm in this world, we value God's beloved creation and we seek to be faithful stewards of it, which is our call. Do no harm. Listen to the teaching of Reuben Job in his book, Three Simple Rules. He says, Each of us knows groups that are locked in conflict, sometimes over profound issues and sometimes over things that are just plain silly. But the conflict is real, the divisions are deep, and the consequences can often be devastating. If, however, all who are involved can agree to do no harm, the climate in which the conflict is going on is immediately changed. How is it changed? He says, well, if I'm to do no harm, I can no longer gossip about the conflict. I can no longer speak disparagingly about those involved in the conflict. I can no longer manipulate the facts of the conflict. I can no longer diminish those who don't agree with me and must honor each as a child of God. I will guard my lips, my mind, and my heart so that my language will not disparage, injure, or wound another child of God. I must do no harm even while I seek a common good. This act of disarming Laying aside our weapons and our desire to do harm is revealing in other ways as well. He says, we discover that we stand on common ground. We inhabit a common precious space, share a common faith, feast at a common table, and have another measure of God's unlimited love. When I'm determined to do no harm to you, I lose my fear of you. I'm able to see you and hear you more clearly. Disarmed of the possibility to do harm, we find that good and solid place to stand where together we can see the way forward in faithfulness to God. Do no harm. Do no harm is a teaching that I believe helps us catch ourselves in the act as it were. It's a teaching that stops us before we say words that we might regret or act in ways that are angry, damaging, or cruel. Sometimes when we find ourselves speechless or not knowing what to do, those moments may leave us feeling vulnerable, but there are also moments in which we can turn to God for help. And that's certainly the example from the letter that Paul wrote to Thessalonica. 
Paul journeyed to share the love of God with others, and in doing so, he faced stiff opposition. He was beaten, imprisoned, and treated shamefully, and yet he continued on. Throughout his mission, he steered clear of harming others through deceit, impure motives, or trickery. He didn't seek flattery, and he kept far from greed, even as he tried not to be a burden to anyone. In the face of persecution, he aimed to be gentle, he aimed to show care, and to give of himself and to love, all so that the good news about Jesus could be shared. And you have to wonder how he did it. How did he find the discipline and the courage to love in the face of resistance, all the while keeping himself from inflicting harm on others? Well, Paul will tell you he didn't do it alone. Paul said, even though we suffered, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel. Paul found his strength and his courage in God and not in himself. That's where we will find our help in times when we are tempted to be less than kind. Do no harm. With God's help, it will change your life. This simple rule, one powerful moment at a time. It is hard work, and yet in the midst of the hard work of holding on to love at all times, you might find yourself suddenly set free. We're in a moment when your feelings were hurt by a friend or by a stranger. In the next moment, as you seek to not return harm, you might find yourself removed from the fear of someone's opinion and instead find yourself standing on the firm ground of God's love for them and for you. In this very moment, God is preparing us to go out into a day, into a week, into a month, into a life full of moments in which we have the opportunity to live as Christ, the love of God and the love of neighbor as self. Like Pat, we're not perfect yet, but we do have a place to begin on that perfection journey, to be perfect in love. As we seek to live our love for God and neighbor, let us begin by doing no harm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we come now to our time of prayer, and I hope that you will spend some time in the quiet. Let it get quiet in here if you can. Hopefully you have a little quiet around you or can for a moment if you have young people around you. We have quiet moments and busy moments and loud moments all in the life of church. It's all part of us. So in this quiet moment, can you know that God is with you? That's always true, but can you let yourself become attentive to it now? And can you open yourself to the needs and gifts of this world and to God's hope for this world, its communities, its families, its neighborhoods, you. Friends, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, your humble children, call out for your blessing on us. We adore you for your name is love. Your nature is compassion. Your presence is joy. Your word is truth. Your spirit is goodness. Your holiness is beauty. Your will is peace. Your service is perfect freedom. And in knowledge of you, we find eternal life. To you be all honor and glory and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it's time to head into that day, that week, that month, that life. Go with this blessing. Would you go now in peace? May the love of God surround you everywhere you may be, so that you would be empowered to rejoice and to serve. Amen. <music>